Welcome to Conversations in Process, hosted by Jay McDaniel and co-sponsored by the Cobb Institute and Open Horizons. These conversations explore a way of understanding and living in the world that emphasizes the continual becoming and fundamental interconnectedness of all things. But they're also intended to provide an ongoing interaction in which the stories, insights, and wisdom of each conversation partner can expand your horizon and enrich your journey and process. In this conversation, Jay visits with Rick Tarnas and Matt Siegel. Richard Tarnas is a professor of philosophy and cultural history at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where he founded the graduate program in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. He teaches courses in the history of ideas, archetypal studies, depth psychology, and religious evolution. He frequently lectures at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara and was formerly the Director of Programs and Education at Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. He is the author of The Passion of the Western Mind and Cosmos and Psyche, Intimations of a New World View. He is also a past president of the International Transpersonal Association and served on the Board of Governors for the C.G. Jung Institute of San Francisco. Matthew D. Siegel is an assistant professor in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program at California Institute of Integral Studies, where he teaches courses primarily on German idealism and Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy. He is the author of the soon-to-be-published Physics of the World Soul, Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology, and has published journal articles and book chapters on a wide range of topics, including panpsychist metaphysics, media theory, the philosophy of biology, the evolution of religion, and psychedelics. He blogs regularly at footnotesdeplato.com and tweets way more than he should with the handle at thou art that. His current obsessions include the panpsychist turn in contemporary philosophy of mind and its implications for the scientific study of the origins of life and consciousness. It's great to be with with both of you, and Rick. I've I've read a little of your work, not a lot of your work. I find it so interesting, and I'm looking forward to exploring aspects of your work together. And that certainly includes astrology. And I can't wait to get there, but we need to get there. And Matt, um, I've read some of your work the same, and I know that you are steeped, among other things, in Whitehead. So this can be a conversation about. Whitehead and the thought of Rick Tarnas and, and anything else we want to talk about, actually. But, but Rick, to get started, could you tell me at least a little bit about how you got started and where all this began for you um, in your earlier life? A little background, if you don't mind. Sure. And thank you, Jay, for welcoming me and, uh, and, and Matt for being part of the conversation because I, uh, I, I value uh, your your expertise on Whitehead in, in particular, but you know your insights on on many things. And and Jay, as a as someone who's been interviewing so many people for um, the process um, thought world, uh, I'm, I'm I'm honored to be. Although I've done a few things for uh, in process philosophy conferences, like the big one we had in. Um, in 2015, wasn't it June 2015? Uh, <clears throat> in at Claremont. Uh, nevertheless, it, it's it's one of those we're we're like uh, kind of overlapping um, communities of of discourse, and uh, so I'm 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 very happy to be part of of yours in in this moment. Um, you know, I was thinking about you know, of course, speaking of how I got started. A, a kind of a huge question, and, and it depends on what's what got started or what part of me got started uh, as to how I frame it. And I was thinking one way of entering into it would be to th think about the sequence of encounters with Whitehead and Whitehead's thought, because in some sense it it uh, that those occurred in a. Um, in a kind of narrative unfolding <clears throat> that's still happening, it, it, I 
you know, although I was born in Geneva, Switzerland, I, I grew up in the United States. I was educated <clears throat> by Jesuits in high school. And um, one of the things the Jesuits are good at is <clears throat> they, they want to uh, give you a, a large range of perspectives. And uh, they, there's not as much dogmatism as one might get in certain other um, you know, parochial schools and, and so forth. So, and particularly in the 1960s, that was the, that was the case. And I was assigned uh, in probably junior or senior year of high school, so I would have been probably around 17, maybe 18, uh, a, an essay about the thought of uh, Whitehead, uh, Bergson, and Teilhard Chardin, and uh, they put put those three together as kind of representing a uh, an important m integrative movement in contemporary thought. That uh, and and it was done in a way that it wasn't written for high school students, but it was written for you know intelligent general readers, let's say. And and I I was quite quite take I could see. Uh, these are my guys, you know. I, I could, I could, I could feel that their perspectives were were ones that I could very much relate to. And interestingly, around the same time, there was another uh, essay that we read that grouped together Darwin, uh, Marx, and Freud as us as for different re for, you know for a different reason uh, which you can uh, immediately grasp uh, just putting those three names together and I was also you know pretty compelled by by their perspectives which I you know had some familiarity with before reading the essay but having them grouped together and noting how much they became uh, in some sense, their thought got integrated into mainstream 20th century thought in a way that uh, Whitehead, Bergson, and, and Teilhard uh, were not. They, they remained more almost like part of the intellectual counterculture, uh, you, you might say. And I found uh, aspects of, of Darwin, Freud, and Marx also very compelling and in a way, I, I guess my life has unfolded in a way that has been constantly seeking the, uh, you know, kind of integration of of different po polarities, and that was that was an, one that came in pretty pretty early. Um, one other, th <laughs> my my high school years were probably not that different than most other high school years, so I don't want to make it seem as if we were. Especially hyper intellectual, but I also remember getting a, a a lecture by our principal who came in for a special presentation for the uh, classical honors class, the uh, the the class that studied Greek and Latin, uh, and uh, he gave a lecture about Plato's and Aristotle's thought, how it connected to Augustine and Aquinas, and. Uh, that just, I was so compelled by that. It's like I immediately got what he, he was talking about with, with the, the platonic ideas, the archetypal uh, forms. It made so much sense to me. And I, I kind of saw th things already kind of through that lens when I'm, you know, I'm reading, uh, say, Tolstoy's War and Peace, which I was very affected by in, in those years, or, or Crime and Punishment, let's say, by Dostoevsky, I, or, or you see Bergman's Seventh Seal, you see the archetypal just kind of blazing forth right out of the work of art. And uh, it, it just made sense to me, this archetypal perspective and how it got shifted or kind of tweaked, nuanced by Aristotle, you know, towards a more imminent direction. And... Uh, and then how it got carried into uh, medieval uh, Christian thought, and and then onward, and so that also played a um, an, a kind of engaging. That was like another another part of the puzzle that I puzzle doesn't quite another another part of the of the adventure really. You know, I I was, I was feeling at that at that time. So those are those are kind of early origins, and then 
I remember at at Harvard, I uh, took. I was very much affected by a course on the history of planetary astronomy that Thomas Kuhn had begun, uh, and his his. But when I took it, his younger contemporary uh, was teaching it. Owen Owen Gingerich, a, a great uh, historian of science and expert on Copernicus and Kepler, and and he assigned the. Uh, Thomas Kuhn's major works, uh, <clears throat> course structure, scientific revolutions, and and um, the Copernican revolution. Those two books, but in uh, the latter book, the Copernican revolution, Whitehead was was cited in a way that made me think I was he, he Whitehead was saying certain things about the relationship of medieval theology to the emergence of modern scientific thought. And I thought, whoa, this is, this is good. This is like continuity, et cetera. So these kept planting seeds. And then, you know, finally uh, in the, in the 90s, when John Buchanan, who is kind of a, a real supporter of the process Whitehead uh, world, and also is deeply <clears throat> influenced by Stanislav Gross work, and um, I hate to be narrating this this much uh, at the beginning, but you, you asked a pretty big question. But anyway, I'll I'll just uh, kind of complete this by saying, you know, I went on to Esalen Institute in the 1970s, particularly to study with Stan Groff, and uh, but also you know people like Gregory Bateson and and Joseph Campbell were, were there, and and uh, Houston Smith. I was quite influenced by all of them, but particularly Stan Groff. John Buchanan was also very influenced by Groff. And he brought together a, uh, sometime in the 1990s at Esalen, he brought together a group of process philosophers, including John Cobb and um, uh, David Ray Griffin and uh, uh, Catherine Keller. And Actually, Catherine Keller and and David Ray Griffin had already played a big role in uh, connecting with Jungian thought, with that uh, the archetypal process uh, uh, conference in the in the early '80s, and I was close to James Hillman, uh, uh, both in his thought, but I also knew him well, and and so I was taking in young Hillman and Whitehead as another kind of really interesting dialogue that was going on. Catherine played a big role in that. So they all came to this conference at Esalen that Stan Groff and I were also part of, and John Buchanan. And uh, that dialogue uh, kind of seeded itself in my mind. And then the last stage of this was Brian Swim and I uh, at California Institute of Integral Studies, where we have co-taught together uh, where we have taught both together as in co-teaching courses, but it, um, generally have been teaching parallel tracks for years in our philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program. And we co-taught a course that used the very rich uh, book on uh, called Archetypal Process, the, the uh, I think what's called the Self and, the, and Divine in Jung, Whitehead and uh, Hillman, or, or, or Whitehead, Jung, and Hillman, something like that. And it was, uh, that was a great course for me, uh, just the, the dialogue that happened, learning much more about, and of course, we were reading um, more of Whitehead than I had read up until that point. So it's just been an, a, a continual unfolding. And then Matt, who, whose work, uh, who, who, who I respect so so much, and whose work particularly uh, was um, centered on Whitehead's thought, not not alone, but as a huge um, kind of one of his major uh, inspirations and centers. Uh, that that also has helped keep Whitehead the the perspective, the vocabulary, the richness of the of, of the worldview that Whitehead was articulating has, has kept that very much in in my mind's eye. So that's that's my, that's kind of a, a narrative about my encounter encounters with Whitehead that perhaps gives a little sense of my own unfolding. Well, that's 
uh, very interesting to me. And uh, I've been influenced by almost all the thinkers that you just named. And that includes Groff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I recognized from the outset um, how brilliant he is. And I was especially grateful for his mapping out states of ex extraordinary consciousness. And, and it, it just, I always sensed that Whitehead's perspective could be quite open uh, to multiple states of mind and consciousness, but that needed to be excavated. And it needed to be in dialogue with someone who in some ways had done that. And for me, Graf was, is one that had, I was familiar with Tibetan Buddhist understandings of multiple states of consciousness and, and Hindu um, thought concerning that, but Graf, Graf was special for me. Now, now Matt, um, it, it, just briefly, how did you discover Whitehead? How did that happen? Um, so I initially, in I think uh, my freshman year of college was very interested in um, consciousness and um, you know you, we're talking about Groff altered consciousness um, psychedelic experience and so I was listening to a lot of uh, recorded lectures of Terence McKenna and it was in I think several of his lectures at the time where he's he kept dropping Whitehead's name and using Whitehead to uh, his philosophy of organism, so-called, and his you know, concepts of concrescence and um, the advance into novelty and all these terms that uh, struck me as just in, in, infinitely interesting. And so um, you know, I started to research you know, who was this guy and was initially kind of put off by all of, I just kept seeing the refrain like, really hard to read, impossible to understand, all these new words, on and on. And so I waited until um, graduate school, actually, at, at CIIS. Um, when I was, uh, I started when I was 22, and, and uh, there was a adjunct professor at the time named Eric Weiss, um, who's done a lot of work on Whitehead and postmortem existence and, and transpersonal psychology and whatnot. And so he introduced me in a formal, you know, academic context uh, to Whitehead's thought. And I began reading and I haven't stopped. I've probably um, read Process and Reality. I mean, parts of it a dozen times, but, you know, the whole book several times over. And I, I continue to be enriched by um, new perspectives that it opens up for me. And so, you know, he's, yes, it's difficult, but, um, it's the type of of writing that I think also kind of has the psychedelic effect. It alters one's consciousness. Um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely orbit around Whitehead and have, you know, for more than a decade now. And um, I haven't gotten tired of, of it yet. Uh, <laughs> and certainly with new students coming in every year, I've noticed that the interest in Whitehead is only growing. I can't keep up with all the new publications, you know, um, in a way that I thought that I could when I was writing my dissertation, you know, five years ago. But, uh, but yeah, it was it was Terrence McKenna. You know, uh, Matt, I'm 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 thinking about how when when we were uh, when Brian and I were co-teaching that class uh, on Whitehead and and Jung and depth psychology. We, I remember uh, speaking at a certain point about if I were to picture Whitehead's ontology, it would be very much like an Alex Gray painting, uh, th which he which he created particularly to convey uh, psychedelic uh, extraordinary states of consciousness, mm -hmm. and uh, but just that that sense of how how much every Every noun is is a is is really is really a verb, you know, and and uh, with adverbial uh, qualifications, and and constantly unfolding in in uh, creative uh, novelty uh, is, yeah, it I can see the 
I often have wondered, in fact, I'll ask, I'd be interested in what you two think about this. How did Whitehead, <laughs> when I read Whitehead, he's got, uh, he, he seems to have a grasp of an ontology that normally would be accessible to people only in extraordinary states of consciousness. And when I've read Whitehead's bi biographies, uh, I've, I've never got a sense that he, you know, was an er early experimenter with, with uh, mescaline or anything. Uh, it really seems to have emerged for him like, Athena out of Zeus's head. I mean, I, I just don't quite uh, know how he did it. Um, it was like a kind of a revelatory disclosure that he was able to to bring into the culture. Anyway, I, have, have you, Jay, uh, or Matt ever either had similar thoughts about wondering how did he see this, you know, or do you, did it, do you think it, it's not that extraordinary? Uh, for, for me, there are some sides of Whitehead that are often overlooked by Whitehead scholars. And um, one is what I would call the phenomenological side of Whitehead. Uh, that side of Whitehead, which is aware of and sensitive to uh, lived human experience uh, from the inside, uh, first person perspective. And I think he was um, very much aware of the fact that consciousness is uh, but the tip of the iceberg when it comes to lived human experience. So he would often speak of the depths of experience. He liked that word depths. And he had this notion of experience in the mode of causal efficacy, which was different from clear ordinary consciousness, but which for him was more fundamental. And he seems to have, he had a sense of memory and the role that memory plays um, in all experience, not simply conscious memory, but pre-conscious memory. So while I don't think that you can find in Whitehead accounts of extraordinary experiences, um, you can find sensibilities that were disposed to think that there's much more to experience than meets the eye of simple, clear consciousness. Also, he was very much at home in the world of potentiality. Uh, for him, potentials were indeed real, uh, not necessarily actual, but real. Um, and part of that was the mathematical side of Whitehead. You know, he, he was at home talking about multiple um, dimensions of potential reality, he had a whole notion of that called the extensive continuum that's much more than three-dimensional space. Um, and so I think that too may have played a role, This just a sense that there, there truly is more to our cosmos than meets the, meets the, the, the clear eye. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Actually, that's... Matt, what, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, well, the notion of um, porous boundaries, I think, was mm -hmm. something that Whitehead became familiar with reading the nature poets, the romantic poets, uh, Wordsworth in particular. But um, he, you know, he loved all of the uh, uh, British poets of the romantic period, and um, so he really had a sense for the way that we are permeated by nature, and mm -hmm. the, the way that. Um, at a deeper level, as you're saying, our human consciousness kind of bottoms out into yeah. the depths of that um, cosmic expanse. And so I don't think he ever bought the, um, the sort of, you know, sense of a, a separate mental substance uh, that yeah. was parachuted into this, this world from beyond it. Um, but yeah, I think also, you know, there's there's so few um, figures in the history of thought who were not only um, sensitive aesthetically to art and poetry, uh, but who were also capable of um, mathematical uh, feats of abstraction that I'll never be you know capable of of approaching. Um, you know, even someone like Goethe, who's such a Renaissance man, 
um, bridging the arts and the sciences, didn't have much of a capacity for math. Uh, Whitehead does, you know, or, or Whitehead did. And so it's like, he really does have that full picture of um, human experience. But yeah, I don't see any indication that he altered his consciousness other than with um, a few glasses of wine. Um, and he doesn't even seem to have been much of a drinker, uh, having read some of his dialogues with Lucy and Price, apparently he and his wife Evelyn were um, teetotalers for a time, which is a, a British term for abstinence from alcohol, basically. And so he was a pretty sober minded person with a very dynamic imagination. And he had a sense of beauty. And, you know, the, the concept of beauty plays a prominent role in his thought, particularly in Adventures of Ideas. And, and I've, I've heard that he was influenced by his wife in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he was indebted to her for, for reminding him that there's more, uh, there's, there's more to life than um, clear ideas. <laughs> uh, there are vague senses of beauty. Um, Rick, I, I don't think we want to dwell on the problem of mechanism because that's so many people that are listening to this know about that side of Whitehead and perhaps that, that side of, of your thought. But would you say just a word about how it dawned on you that a mechanistic understanding of, of the world, of the universe, um, was a problem? How, how did that emerge for you? Uh, be before I forget, uh, I, I just, uh, I, what you both just said, um, I very, is very helpful for me. And as you spoke, Jay, about those, the phenomenological side of Whitehead taking it in, uh, he, the words that you are using remind me very much of, of uh, both William James and, and, and then Bergson with the memory, James with that sense of being so sensitive to the complex phenomenology of, 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 of our uh, uh, experience. And and then I, I had in the back of my mind uh, Whitehead's um, you know deep appreciation of of uh, English Romantic poetry, which which you brought up, Matt, uh, and so those those combined. There, and then the other thing was when you brought up um, Jay his the uh, well both of you brought up the role of his wife. Um, well, Jay, you in particular, uh, I had this memory of how hearing at Harvard about how Whitehead, when he was a, a professor there, would have students come over for like, I don't know, something like a, a, a weekly dinner or something like that uh, and host them. Uh, and uh, the, I don't know, somehow the, the generosity, the hospitality, the again that kind of uh, combination that sort of Socratic combination of of eros and logos coming together that he was able I I just think it would have been marvelous to have been uh, a a Harvard student at that time I mean not that not that I regret being there in the late sixties but being there in the in the thirties would have been pretty cool too with if if I had taken something with with Whitehead and I remember studying I I would go to see where each where he lived, you know, uh, in Cambridge and, uh, or see where William James's house was, how it was, uh, adjacent to, uh, R Royce's house. And I suddenly got a new sense for how their conversation would be, um, you know, so much more likely to have taken place as neighbors. Uh, anyway, it, I, I just, those are just some reflections on, on the interesting ways in which biography, uh, shapes philosophy and Nietzsche's idea that every every philosophy is a confession is uh, deeply true. I think uh, n not that the not that it's being confessional or that personal is necessarily a constraint. I think that's a it's that can be a window as well as a, as a wall, you know, um, to, uh, it can be a window into, into wider, deeper perspectives. Uh, it, it, as well, it can also be a constraint if one gets locked into, into it. So, uh, 
the problem of mechanism. It was always such an unattractive um, <laughs> worldview, you know, or ontology, the mechanistic worldview. It always seemed kind of self-evidently inadequate uh, to me. And that probably came from uh, being more lined up. We almost, we had to take a cho choice or make a choice in our teenage years as to whether we were going to be focused particularly on the sciences or, or on the humanities. And I chose the humanities. I was so interested in history. Uh, Greek and Latin came pretty easily. And um, it, it's really only been in the last uh, 15 years well, then I got it, uh, deeply into the history of planetary astronomy. Uh, that that was just fascinating to me, but only because the I felt that as I was being taught that the only way in which one could really understand how we move from the Ptolemaic uh, cosmos to the Copernican and post-Copernican universe was you had to understand it in terms of the larger frame of uh, reference that culture provides. Uh, religious uh, and aesthetic uh, uh, factors, um, spiritual uh, uh, and metaphysical uh, principles shaped the 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 empirical um, development and shaped how the theories emerged, including things like the Platonic uh, and and Pythagorean elevation of the sun uh, in a kind of spiritual way, or the focus on um, the elegant perfect mathematical perfection of the heavens as being an emanation of the of the uh, divine order that uh, was being that if we took the anomalies of you know, the apparent retrograde movements of the planets and so forth, if we took those at face value, this kind of ruined the celestial perfection of the divine um, order. And this basic kind of platonic orientation, uh, as well as all sorts of factors involving the evolution of Christian thought in the Middle Ages and, and then Renaissance humanism and so forth, these played such a crucial role in making even possible the, it just wasn't a matter of bringing the telescope up and getting new empirical data. That just wasn't, wasn't the, the, the truth. In fact, I think Kuhn put it pretty baldly. He said, the telescope, Galileo's telescope played a great role for in, uh, in, in the propaganda for the Copernican revolution, um, but it didn't achieve the Copernican revolution. It was, it was um, much more done at, you know, in terms of Kepler's mathematics and the, and the uh, really the conceptual uh, reframing the whole gestalt that was shifted by uh, an evolving kind of cultural, spiritual, aesthetic uh, frame of reference ra rather than just pure new data coming in and therefore we're making new rational uh, um, uh, extrapolations from it. And I came to see, you know, like the great, the emergence of something like the mechanistic worldview, which, you know, has stages from ancient Greek thought uh, coming from the um, uh, Democritus and and the, the atomists and, and, but it's really in medieval uh, nominalism that the that the mechanistic worldview starts being uh, incorporated ag again, and you know because Aristotle and Plato were so dominant up until that point, and it's really like 14th century and 15th century when it starts to come back, and then of course Descartes poof, comes in like the uh, um, juggernaut intellectual juggernaut that he was tied to, uh, as was John Locke, tied to a whole kind of transformation of a sense of human identity in the world, uh, that the mechanistic worldview was mutually implicated with a whole new sense of tremendous um, uh, rational and moral autonomy that the, uh, that the emerging modern sensibility felt in relationship to the natural world, uh, et cetera, and, and, and a new 
a new relationship to, you know, I, I think in some ways at the very moment that the decentering of the cosmos took place, the decentering of the earth uh, from uh, the as the focal point of the cosmos, the modern mind overcame that sense of decentering by recentering, finding a new center, a new higher center in in human reason that was God given, and like the sun, allowed uh, the human being and a particularly a certain type of human being to shine its light of rational clarity over everything in the universe and understand it with a from a kind of centered place and uh and that gave tremendous confidence to the modern mind the modern project uh, uh with you know both positive and catastrophic results um because of the subject object differentiation the exploitation of of a of a disenchanted um, natural world that could just be seen as um, uh, neutral matter, undeserving of any moral claims. And then finally, the uh, that confidence of the rational, largely masculine European mind and culture, civilization in relationship to every other culture and civilization in the world uh, that it could now feel radically superior to and needing to, in some sense, either reform or in its worst forms, uh, in its worst way of expressing this, uh, obliterate uh, as, as part of its progress. Um, so yeah, the mechanistic worldview always seemed uh, unconvincing in terms of it didn't adequately address human experience and nature always t seemed to and sold to me to be explicable that way so um it was just a kind of gradual in terms of it, seeing it as being something we need to actively oppose i i think that only came in subsequent decades as my own intellectual projects became more clear and also as the ecological ramifications of the mechanistic worldview became more more vividly uh, evident. Well, thank you. Uh, that, that all makes great sense to me. Uh, Matt, is there anything you would like to add um, to what Rick just said, just about the problem of mechanism and or your relationship to it. Yeah, I mean, I think like Rick, I didn't ever find it convincing. Um, you know, when I was a younger uh, person, like early teens, I did become really interested in the sciences and in biology and in physics. And um, most of the popular accounts um, written by scientists tend to be more materialistic and mechanistic in, in their general orientation. And, and so, you know, I would read as a 14 year old as, as much as, as I could make sense of it. Um, you know, Stephen Hawking or, or Richard Dawkins. And, um, at that point I was less inclined to buy into the mechanistic universe as I was to rebel from the more, um, dogmatic form of, of Christianity that, um, you know, my, my, uh, mother was, uh, trying to, um, encourage me to take up. And so, um, but that was it And this, this really plays into the point that I, I think Rick is making that's so important is that this mechanistic worldview was just as much, if not more so about a new moral orientation, um, as it was, and this you know picks up on Charles Taylor's work and, and others, uh, just as much about a new moral orient orientation as it was new new data that was discovered about how nature really is. You know, so um, for me, this learning about science from this materialistic perspective as a as a young teen was uh, about feeling superior to uh, what I perceived to be the less bright religious outlook you know, and I see a lot of, 
adults who get stuck in that sort of moral posture. Um, and so it was, it what allowed me to grow out of that was reading more philosophy um, and, and more psychology, depth psychology in particular, you know, Carl Jung and, and being exposed to Nietzsche in high school and um, popularizers of Buddhism like Alan Watts uh, kind of helped me see that, oh, there's more to this religion and spirituality thing than um, I had realized. And so that shifted my moral posture towards, um, you know, the religious dimension of, of, of reality. And then I became more interested sort of in college in the alternative forms of science that are not mechanistic, but that are more organic. And this was when I was taking up Whitehead's thought. Um, and so, you know, I never bought into the mechanistic worldview, even while I think the attendant moral posture that supported it was something, you know, that I moved through as a, as a teenager. You can always, uh, as you're speaking, Matt, I'm just feeling how much you, in some sense, recapitulated, um, the, the history of, of, the, of the, of the Western, uh, mm -hmm. sensibility, you know, because in, in some way it was, it was a, a crucial, um, step to take in liberating uh, at, in order to um, break away from the, the more constricting elements of medieval Christianity, for example, um, and the, the wars of religion uh, that were tearing Europe apart in the very period that that Descartes lived and, and, and Kepler and, and so forth and, and, and Newton, um, to have this, uh, this third way in a sense, Protestant Catholic, and then, then the scientific perspective that seemed to transcend religious, um, sectarianism and also didn't carry with it all sorts of superstitious baggage and, uh, you know, some of the very things perhaps that you were trying to differentiate yourself from your, your mother's form of Christianity. Uh, and so one has to go through that kind of differentiation in some, in some form, which our entire civilization did, or a large part of it. And then, and then only can you move to a, an, another place where you start to go, oh, wait, well, there's, there's more to this, uh, tension of opposites than, than I first grasped. And then you start realizing there's, there's truths on both sides, but not necessarily the way they were being framed, uh, when they're being imposed on us. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to turn, uh, in this last portion of our conversation to the movements of the stars and planets, uh, to astrology and, uh, Rick, from um, a Whiteheadian perspective, every moment of our experience not only is shaped by the cosmos, but includes the cosmos, directly or indirectly. Uh, Whitehead actually speaks of a moment of concrescence as a concrescence of the universe. So it's not simply a concrescence, a process of feeling the many into one gestalt that's private. It's actually uh, an activity of the universe in us. Mm -hmm. that, that's his language. And so it is always, that would include, uh, so in some ways, our experience includes the movements of the stars and the planets. And, and it certainly includes a collective unconscious that includes energies and intelligences deeper than conscious life. So when I have heard, when I have thought about astrology and the, 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 the idea that if, if everything is connected, well, then our lives must be in some way connected with the movements of the stars and the planets. But that's as far as I've taken it. 
you know, I, I, I registered that, that made sense to me, and I went on with my life. So I'm wondering if you want to take my thought a step further um, and, and great, help, me to, help me to think about astrology in a deeper, a still deeper way, and then I want Matt to chime in as well. That would be great. And that's a great way of framing it in the premise that you, you've given. Um, I think your description of, of Whitehead's recognition of how uh, <clears throat> each how the universe uh, is unfolding inside us, not just influencing us. Uh, the concrescence involves that, uh, <clears throat> the internal relationship to the whole. And it's very similar to Rumi's uh, little poem about, the, we are not only the, the drop in the divine ocean, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the ocean is in the drop. Right. And that's kind of Whitehead's point in a way. Now, it's it's an enormous, nevertheless, it still feels like an enormous conceptual leap from that Whiteheadian sense of the cosmos's active presence within the unfolding of every occasion of experience uh, in, in every concrescence. It's a, it seems like a big step from that to anything like the kind of uh, astrological specifics that you that one would run into in, in, in studying astrology. And I have to say it, it, that was something that I would I was not considering to be a likely candidate for um, a compelling worldview. Uh, and what shifted in early in the years that I was at Esalen Institute, uh, I had I'd gone there to study with Stan Groff. And my my plan was to be writing my doctoral dissertation on the the history of archetypes from Plato to Jung, or Plato and Aristotle to Jung and Steiner, depending on how much I carefully I framed it. But my uh, dissertation advisor urged me, given my background and his interests, I su suspect too, this is Thomas Hanna, uh, uh, and my interest in Stan Gross work and the fact that I could go to Esalen and study with, with Stan there. I didn't know that I'd end up stay, staying there for 10 years, but the fact that I could do that my dissertation advisor said, you know, you really should write your dissertation uh, as a kind of handbook of LSD psychotherapy, so, which is what I did. And of course, back then in the mid seventies, that was not exactly a widespread, uh, you know, topic of, for a dissertation. Now, now it'd almost be like, yeah, let's, this would, there's probably quite a few universities that would look favorably upon some kind of a project like that. But back then it was, it was not, it was much more um, peripheral by, by legal fiat. And um, what Stan and I were working with at that point was a, was a peculiarity of LSD session reports and, and clinical experience, which is that two people uh, could have the exact same substance like LSD-25, and the exact same dosage and have such radically different experiences that uh, it would be, one one could be uh, a, a essentially a kind of beatific vision um, and the other person could, could be in hell uh, in a very vividly terrifying way. And you couldn't predict that using any of the characteristic and uh, any of the main psycho psychological tests that we had available at that point, which were like the Rorschach, uh, the thematic apperception test, TAT, the MMPI, um, and uh, uh, a few other uh, such standard psychology tests. And uh, in addition, the same person could take the same substance, same dose at different times and have radically different experiences. And the stakes are pretty high with this because 
you know, I think probably many of your listeners uh, will have had their psychedelic um, journeys and they'll have some familiarity with the fact that it's a, uh, it's, it's an adventure with, with high stakes. I mean, there, there's, you can feel that your whole um, sanity is on the line at times. You can feel your, the, your worldview shifting under your feet. Um, it can lead to uh, the heights as well as the depths of human experience. And some people, perhaps all of us since one way at one time or another are not necessarily prepared for what can unfold in those conditions. And Stan and I were, and, and actually a, a whole generation of psychedelic therapists had been looking for some way of being able to predict whether a person would be a good candidate for um, this kind of powerful therapeutic um, means. And one day uh, at Esalen, which both you no doubt know how much Esalen, you know, particularly in the 60s and 70s, was such a kind of epicenter of multiple uh, teachings, practices, traditions, ancient, modern, uh, new paradigm, uh, esoteric, uh, etc. And one of the beauties of the place was that no one was... At, no one uh, could was allowed to capture the flag, as we put it. Um, there, it was it was a radically pluralistic um, learning community. And so, like Dane Rujar, who was a famous uh, astrologer of the twentieth century, very erudite man, uh, who had kind of integrated uh, Jung with the theosophical and astrological tradition he came there to teach and and others uh, and one day uh an artist who was in one of stan gross month-long seminars where he would have people like fritschoff capra and uh, david bohm would come in and give lectures and uh but there'd be about 30 students or participants in the seminar and one of those 30 participants one time in uh, early 1976, was a um, was an artist who also happened to be uh, deeply into astrology, and he said in his experience that people's um, ongoing uh, experience in life was correlated with their what he called the transits of where the planets were in the sky at any given time relative to where they were at the birth chart, and Stan and I were just you know, we were open, we had pretty much opened up to most things on the horizon as having certain potential validity, but astrology was really the last one we considered. But he was, uh, this man, his name was Arne Tredovic. Uh, he, he, he taught us how to calculate birth charts and how to calculate transits, which he had to do by hand then. There were personal computers weren't around. And um, we, uh, then looked at what our, um, our own personal history of LSD sessions. We had good records, good, good session report, uh, to, to be able to look at and look at what the transits were and see, uh, how those see what the textbooks, uh, of the astrological textbooks said, what are the likely things to happen under a transit such as Neptune conjoining your son or, uh, the, um, opposition of, uh, Uranus to Jupiter or something like that. And it was, um, a shocking kind of revelation to see the precision with, and consistency with which the kind of generic cookbook descriptions in these astrological textbooks, which were not talking about psychedelic experiences, they were talking about everyday experiences. But if you extrapolated the themes that they were talking about, like this transit is uh, tends to uh, happen at times when people's uh, people uh, have their horizons suddenly opened up by uh, travel, uh, exposure to new cultures, uh, new ideas or whatever. And, or this can be a very difficult uh, time uh, when one can feel one's making no 
one's feeling defeated or alone or in uh, lonely or making uh, no progress in life, etc. And it's a it's a gestalt. It's not like this is the reality. This is the experiential feeling that can go with this transit. So we we were blown away by it, and then we we kind of systematically opened up our our circle of research to see checking all of the transits. People just used to line up, you know, for at Esalen to get the the readings. Because so many were going through deep experiences there as a great laboratory for transformational for this kind of research, uh, check seeing what was happening for people going through powerful transformational periods. And then uh, I took it from there to studying, uh, well, what did Freud have when he uh, suddenly had his kind of psychoanalytic uh, breakthrough or or Einstein when he wrote the, uh, the those five papers in 1905, you know, or that had such a huge effect uh, on relativity theory and, 20th century physics and and so forth and it was just um it was just remarkable so it it i i gradually also came to connect that whole um area of research with my interest in platonism and the understanding of archetypes because it was very clear that the archetype that the planetary energies that they would call like planetary energies or the meanings of the planets etc were really what they were describing were were uh, Jungian archetypes in the sense of psychological um, complexes and, and uh, forces that also had a kind of numinous background. They could express themselves as gods and goddesses, you know, in quite vivid experiences in altered states, but also, or in ancient mythological uh, renderings. And then finally, as platonic uh, archetypes, like the principle of beauty could be seen as or experienced as Aphrodite, uh, or it can be experienced as a Jungian archetype that draws us to, you know, highly, you know, aesthetic experiences, beautiful objects, uh, et cetera, music, um, love. And then, uh, and then it also could be understood in a platonic uh, sense as the, the very principle, the, the idea of beauty, capital B, uh, of the beautiful. And all these modes of understanding the archetypes seem to be related to this planetary, uh, to, to how the astrologers were talking about the influences of the, of the planets. And so I just started bringing together the different mm, kind of intellectual strands that I had focused on in the course of my life to uh, explicating what I was seeing here. And it became clear that what Jung, who also, by the way, Jung was very, uh, he studied astrology for quite deeply for several decades and was using it with all his patients in his later years uh, as a clarifying of what's going on in their life uh, in a way that just understanding their dreams was, was kind of his primary focus, but to bring in the understanding of the birth chart and the transits gave him immediate insight into what archetypal dynamics were activated at what time and in what combination. So uh, I came to regard what Jung came, called the um, collective unconscious or the archetypal psyche as in some sense being embedded in the cosmos itself. And that in some very mysterious way, um, the movements of the planets seem to be indicative of, not in a mechanistic causal way, um, but more, if we think of cause, more in Aristotelian uh, formal and final causation, archetypes can be understood as, as ha having a cause, cause, causative role uh, in the constellating of experience that is in some fundamental way connected to the planets. And how that is connected I don't know. The closest I can get is to that uh, a great passage that I came across in Plotinus many years ago in the Aeneids, where he says um, he's talking about how astrology works, and he says it doesn't work in a mechanistic causal way. It's not fatalistic. He said it's more like a. Uh, um, he said the stars are like letters that are inscribed in the heavens. Everything in the world is full of signs. 
all things are interconnected. And then he finishes the passage. He says, as has been said, everything breathes together. And uh, I thought, wow, that that really it's it's a way of describing a synchronistic universe that uh, and and a, and a universe of um, causal efficacy that is um, connected all the way down in terms not just in terms of the material world but in terms of meaning in terms of uh, that in some sense the world is symbolic all the way down too. It's it can communicate um, symbolically, metaphorically, archetypally all the way down. It's not just that's not just a construct of the of the human brain. So in that sense, uh, uh, it I could see how that could connect to a Whiteheadian um, process uh, perspective as well. My, um... Matt, do you want to add something to what Rick just said? And I, I'll offer a, a response as well. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Rick. Um, there's there's so much. <clears throat> I mean, I mean, to connect it to Whitehead, um, you know, one of the ways that I think Whitehead um, inherits the Western philosophical tradition and, and revitalizes it by putting in a cosmological context is, um, and this is an analogy that I know, Rick, that you have, uh, have come to. And, and um, I, it was just so natural to make this analogy. I think, I don't know if you initially influenced me or if I came to this independently, and then we, we, we confirmed this insight that if we look at um, Kant's philosophy and the critique of pure reason and his understanding of categories that shape our experience a priori, um, but in a transcendental way, sort of functioning in, a, in an epistemological way, not as a part of nature, um, but that what allows nature to appear to us in a mechanistic fashion. In Whitehead, um, with his more cosmological orientation, you get a sense that these what had been um, categories in the mind for Kant become, we could call them, Whitehead doesn't use archetype, but we could call them archetypes uh, of the cosmos. And the planetary archetypes in particular seem to function as um, a means of ordering our experience and not determining in the way that Kant thought the categories worked to determine our experience, but rather as uh, fields of potential um, that help to shape the the, the uh, fields of potential for our experience, depending on their um, their movements. And you know, when we think about the movements of the planets, I think the the most apt metaphor is is music. And when Whitehead says that nature is rhythm, uh, I think we can apply that to the movement of the planets and recognize the math the, the complex mathematical harmonies of um of their movements and the way in which our our human consciousness is embedded within that context and uh that indeed as as you introduced this topic jay um each moment each concrescence of our experience is in resonance with uh those spheres that are orchestrating a cosmic symphony right and it, it's not a array of like uh, a force that comes in and, and uh directs our behavior or something but it's it's rather a vibration that we resonate with um and you know i it's a it's a funny term um that i i came up with but you know rick you mentioned jung's synchronicity and Kronos, of course, is a certain uh, a god, but um, um, also archetypally um, implies a certain character of time as kind of linear, just one thing after the next, almost kind of a mechanistic, homogenous conception of time as something we measure with clocks. And there's another Greek term, kairos, which uh, refers more to the, the sense of the right time. You know the the pregnancy of the moment where you know something is 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 supposed to happen, and you know so the term um, 
sync synchirosity came to me, which is not a pretty one, but it I think <laughs> synchronicity kind of points you towards Kronos, whereas I think Kairos gets more at the intent of that term, if you know what I mean. Sure. Yeah. Um, but in any event, uh, qualitative time, uh, in a sense. Yeah, and so time having a texture, having a rhythm, having a seasonal quality to it, I think is is what astrology is um, inviting us to consider. And there are so many places that this touches Whitehead's, you know, organic uh, philosophy that, um, you know, I, I don't think a few of us since at CIS have, have tried to begin formulating exactly what these connections are, but I don't think we've come up with anything definitive yet. So it's a, a, a rich area for uh, further inquiry. Could, could I ask Matt, um, you know, I'm thinking about this, uh, the, yeah, for this kind of interface between uh, Whiteheadian thought and the archetypal astrological, uh, sometimes we call it archetypal cosmology. Um, the because I came to you know the Kant in some sense creates uh, you know we 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 we've called Kant you know that guardian of the threshold. I think I think I wouldn't be surprised that. Steiner used the term too about Kant, but uh, I, yes, Kant so much created a, a sort of um, threshold that our epistemological uh, journey needed to kind of thread the needle, I had to change the metaphor a bit, uh, we needed to get through this um, difficult place that Kant, had, because he seemed to box us in with the a priori categories that you're not really seeing things as they are. And Whitehead offers a way out of that, which is uh, pretty liberating. I hadn't encountered that. So uh, at the time that this is in the 1970s and, and earlier 80s, I was more working, you know, within the Jungian perspective about, and Jung picked up Kant, and he always, even to the end of his life, would talk about um, you know, Kant as, as like the theory of knowledge, and his, Jung's a priori categories were the archetypes, uh, essentially. But that left us in a uh, an uncertainty about what that had to do with the world in itself. We might all be locked in our cranium uh, our, our, our individual craniums, craniums, uh, with, um, our own archetypal projections onto the world and from our own brain corner isolated, and we don't, uh, really see the world as it is. And yet, um, astrology is providing a, a much more kind of complex potential understanding where the world itself, um, is, God, Jung actually has a phrase once where he says, uh, I agree with Karenyi, the Carl Karenyi, the great mythologist. He's, he said, I entirely agree with Karenyi when he says, in the symbol, the world itself speaks. And uh, that's not a Kantian statement. It, 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 he's saying it's the world itself uh, that is speaking. And uh, I came to realize that in some sense in the world, the symbol itself is speaking. Um, that the movements of the planets in some sense are speaking symbolically too. And how could that be? Well, it could be if, if uh, something like human consciousness goes all the way down, that you know, we're not just this kind of completely isolated, strange epiphenomenon, which of course is central to Whitehead's um, breakthrough as well. But the way I got to the point of seeing that the archetypes uh, of astrology played a role with respect to Kant was suddenly realizing, oh, wait a minute, if the planets are moving in, in a way that is coherent with the archetypal uh, s patterns of my subjectivity, then the objective world and the subjective world are more connected than, I th than Kant could possibly uh, have recognized. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, when I combine that with the Groff, with Stan Groff's uh, recognition that in some sense, the Cartesian worldview of the isolated subject against an objective world is part of a kind of 
all, it's it reflects a perinatal gestalt in which you're separated from from the from nature from from the maternal womb you're you're in the you're in a state of radical isolation and it's a it's a it's a it's a powerful gestalt but it's not the whole reality and it turns out that it's part of a process of unfolding of differentiation where you reconnect to the whole and in reconnecting to the whole as you're born embraced by one's mother uh, etc it's a kind of template for all of our journeys through uh, differentiation alienation reconnection to the whole and uh, in in some sense um, the state of rebirth or of birth uh, they they overlap kind of uh, fundamentally they that that represents a breaking out of the Cartesian Kantian isolation into uh, a cosmos that is coherent with and continuous with the human being, inner and outer. Uh, and that that was a so it was a kind of it was through depth psychology rather than through through Whitehead. And then then the efforts to bring together depth psychology and process thought that like uh, I think were I think especially initiated by by Catherine Keller uh, in the early '80s, and then David Ray Griffin and John Cobb uh, bringing everyone together at that conference, and then John Buchanan bringing us all together later. All these have uh, represented, I think, very interesting conversations in which we've through we're seeing through different routes we have gotten to a very similar. But still, you know, there's distinctions between the Whiteheadian process thought. I mean, I'd love to talk about, we're probably running out of time, but I'd love to hear Matt uh, speak a little bit about um, eternal objects and their connection to, to uh, archetypes and uh, including the planetary archetypes, because I think it's a, it's a rich area of discussion. I've got some thoughts about it, but that might be too much for today or it might be too uh, specific. I think that, that can be an opening to part two okay. of, of this podcast. Uh, I'd like to mention uh, some additional areas of further exploration in part two, if that happens. Um, uh, one is the notion of synchronicities and or, or syn... Chirosity. Chirosity. <laughs> It won't stick, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Whitehead has this idea that the divine, uh, that God, is within each of us um, moment by moment as a lure, L-U-R-E, a kind of beckoning energy within us. And this... Um, this is within you, as well as within me, as well as within everything else. The lure is not coercive. It, it cannot manipulate, but it can indeed inspire. And so you can imagine that there would be coordinated lures in highly surprising ways that could be in, that we might call synchronicities. And, and that a, a Whiteheadian um, theist might call also um, providence, not providence in a coercive sense, but providence in an invitational sense. So I think that's an area for, for exploration. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, very, very well uh, put, too. Uh, uh, also, an area for exploration related to this if there is within me, um, and, and beyond me, by the way, this beckoning presence, one question is, how do I discover it? To what do I turn? Um, I might try to go within myself, whatever that would mean. But you need mediators. Mm. You need things to which you can turn that are the living presence of the guidance you seek. 
And I could well understand a Whiteheadian say, um, well, how about turning to the stars? How about turning to the planets? Can they be mediators of this guidance that we seek for our lives? Matt, I'm talking about initial aims here, but the question is, where are they? <laughs> How do you find them? Mm. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's an, an interesting proposal that one place to which you can turn are the movements of the stars and the planets, not only for self-understanding, but also for guidance on how to take a next step in life. Mm. Um, Such a delicious question. Jay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so can we agree that in part two of our podcast, we talk a little bit about that? That'd be, that'd be great. Uh, as far as I'm concerned and I, <clears throat> depending when we do it, uh, I, either, either, I hope that we could just replay what you just said, uh, as our, as our, um, initiate initiation of the conversation because it's so of course you're 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 so articulate you you could probably reproduce it uh perfectly but that was great and um yeah i, I would love to, i would love to explore that idea of the lures the um almost like uh, they they seem to work almost like uh, as you say not compelling but persuading or, or uh, inspiring. They're felt invitations. Felt invitation. That's beautiful. But, and but they're felt. Um, they're not just conceptually entertained. They're felt. Right. It's like a, they're, they sound, sound like gentle final causes in, in Aristotle's yeah, that's sense. That's actually what they are. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, well great. We, we had better, for the moment, uh, bring this to closure, but I thank you both so much. And it's been ri a rich part one, wouldn't you say? Indeed. Yeah, thanks so much, Jay. And, and thanks, Rick. Really great to be in dialogue. Yeah, I, I'm grateful. Thank you for uh, welcoming me. And um, now that I've laid out a, a, enough of my uh, platform or something, my background, et cetera, uh, it, we, it, I would just so much enjoy uh, the, the trialogue uh, next time with, with the two of you so that I can I can hear even even more you you both um, have a lot to teach well uh, I've been taught today for sure and I appreciate it Rick and Matt thank so you until next time until, until next, next time. time take care bye-bye bye. conversations in process is a co-production of the Cobb Institute and open horizons if you'd like to support this podcast and help us realize our aim to advance wisdom, harmony, and the common good, please consider making a donation by visiting cob.institute. That's cob.institute and clicking on the donate button.